So I'm going to talk about something that I call the red brick cancer, which is uh, inspired by uh, the author uh, named Niklas Modig and his co-author Per Ålström uh, from uh, Swedish School of Economics. Uh, myself, I'm Håkan Fors. I'm a lean agile coach from a Vega Group in Stockholm, Sweden. I mostly do embedded coaching with uh, the leaders uh, in the organization. Uh, working with things like flow, Kanban, and uh, other related things. My background is a software developer, but for the last 10 or so years, I've been working with Agile, Scrum, and XP. But uh, for the last four or five years, I've been more bitten by the lean bug and kind of uh, expanding it uh, and using ideas from uh, the different camps. I do most of my work related to Lean and Kanban. I'm an accredited Kanban trainer, uh, but uh, currently not with an, uh, a company that do Kanban trainings. I'm very passionate about cycling. Anyone know which races these are? Yes? Paris Roubaix? Paris Roubaix, up here, yes. Tour de France, yes. My two favorite races, especially when, to the uh, when uh, Paris Robert looks like that, when it's been raining, it's really fun to watch. I'm also very passionate about uh, barbecue, <laughs> and uh, there's a Swedish uh, uh, TV series where the one guy he's kind of out with his barbecue all the time, and I understand I have the model bigger than him, so I'm a little bit proud of that. But today we will talk about uh, something a little bit different. We will talk about uh, flow and resource efficiency, but we will start with a story about Maria and Anna and their experience going through the Swedish healthcare system. We will start, start with Maria. Uh, Maria is 30 years old uh, and it's Monday morning and she's getting dressed and getting ready to go to work and she discovers a lump in her breast. She's of course concerned because breast cancer is uh, the cancer that kills most Swedish women in Sweden. So she wants to do something about it of course and she researches uh, and she contacts her local uh, healthcare center uh, and get an appointment with her family doctor uh, the next day. She meets with her family doctor, she, he examines her, uh, but he unfortunately can't determine if this is cancer or not, so he uh, wants her to consult with uh, a breast specialist at the, breast, uh, the local breast clinic. So she, he sends off a referral for her uh, and is told she will get uh, this referral in the mail uh, when she will have the time. Maria, of course, worried, and uh, she kind of wants this examination to get over with, so she gets the diagnosis. Uh, so she checks her mail every day, uh, but she doesn't uh, get any referral. So eventually, she calls up to the hospital and asks, when is my appointment coming? Uh, where I'm supposed to do the appointment, uh, book the appointment or not. And this very lovely nurse, she kind of goes through the papers and then finally she finds her referral and she says, oh, I found it here, I promise I will process this today uh, and we will send out the referral for you uh, as, as soon as we can. Four days later she gets her referral and uh, the appointment is for the next week. Today, she's going to the clinic, and it's time for the the x-ray <laughs> <laughs> and the ultrasound. Uh, she arrives a little bit early because she don't want to miss her appointment. And something like 15 mi minutes after her appointed time, she gets called in, uh, and they are doing the, the uh, x-ray and the ultrasound, uh, and that just takes uh, just a few minutes. She's told uh, the images will be 
analyzed by a specialist. So she will be sent home and she will get the referral for the next appointment. 10 days later, she is back again uh, at the breast surgeon uh, at the local hospital. The breast surgeon analyzes the images uh, and unfortunately he can't rule out cancer. So he needs to refer her to a cytologist, not a Scientologist, uh, <laughs> to take a tissue sample. Maria is of course worried again and she kind of can't remember uh, what the doctor said. Uh, so she's kind of, were I supposed to, to do this booking or were they supposed to call me and kind of decide when we should meet? So she decides to, to call the hospital uh, the next day and she gets the answering machine but later that day uh, a nurse calls back and she says, well, you don't have to worry, a referral will be sent out to you. She's told that the appointment will uh, get to her in something like two weeks. Two weeks has gone. Uh, Maria has been constantly worried, of course, uh, and she meets with a cytologist and he makes, it takes the tissue sample. Uh, it only takes uh, just a few minutes and then he explains that now we need to send this sample off to this very good uh, laboratory. It's a very expensive and very good laboratory, but it will take some time. And unfortunately, we don't really know how long, how long it takes because they are usually very, very busy. So she, she uh, is told that she will get uh, the appointment in the mail. <coughs> and after six long weeks of waiting, uh, Maria gets back to the hospital and meets with her breast surgeon and she gets the diagnosis. So now let's meet Anna. She's also in her early 30s. It's Tuesday morning, she's in the shower and getting ready to get to work and she also discovered that she has a lump in her breast. She, gets she is of course concerned and during lunch she meets with her best friend and her best friend tells her, well, here in Malmo there's a one-stop breast clinic uh, that you can visit and it's open every Thursday night. So if you want to check this up, please book a time and you, will, uh, you will, can get there on Thursday. So she decides to look it up and she says, she sees on the website, yes, Thursday night is open, so she decides to go. Two days later, it's Thursday night, she gets to the clinic and when she arrives, a specialist nurse is kind of examines her, examines her as she arrives and she says, unfortunately we can't rule out uh, cancer, so you need to see a specialist. Please step back in the waiting room and we will call you as soon as the doctor is available. She gets back in the waiting room and expecting a long wait, but uh, just a few minutes later, uh, she's called back in with the, uh, to meet the breast surgeon. And he, wants, uh, he examines her, but unfortunately he can't really rule out uh, breast cancer, so they need to do an ultrasound and uh, an x-ray. Please step back to the waiting room and we will call you when we have a, a slot available. Once again, Anna is back in the waiting room and she is preparing herself for a long wait. She gets a soda out of the machine and uh, prepares uh, to, for a long wait on reading a, a magazine. But only a few minutes later, her name is called again uh, and uh, the specialist nurse is taking her in and doing the x-ray and immediately walks her to uh, a doctor that makes uh, do the x-ray. Unfortunately, they, they can't determine if this is cancer or not, so they need to do a tissue sample. So, Anna, please go back in the waiting room and we will call you back uh, as soon as we have time. Uh, the nurse picks her up immediately and they go to the Scientologist uh, and they take the tissue sample and he <coughs> apologizes uh, as he asked Anna to go back to the waiting room and wait for some time, 
while he takes the sample to the lab and they do the, uh, the analysis of the sample. Now Anna goes back to the waiting room and she's uh, taking up a magazine and reading and expecting to be there for the rest of the night. But only a few minutes later, she's called in by the breast surgeon and she, he gives her the diagnosis. So these are two different stories. Uh, we have Maria, where the, the lead time for, from when she discovered that she had a lump until she gets the diagnosis took over a thousand hours. And then we have Anna, where it took less than 60 hours from where, when she discovered the lump until she got the diagnosis. And both of these are true stories from the Swedish healthcare system. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is actually just two different business strategies or operational strategies of how you want to operate your business. We have the Maria version where the hospital have optimized for resource efficiency. They want to keep uh, the machines and the specialists occupied as much as possible and are not looking at the actual lead time for the customer or the patient. And on the other side we have Anna where they have optimized for the lead time for her as a patient and they are not as concerned about if they have the machines and the specialists occupied all the time but looking up on focusing on the experience of uh, the customer. So if we take a look at companies that have a resource efficiency first approach of how they run their businesses. So it will typically look something like this. Because you want to have your worker or your machine occupied, you typically have a queue of work in front because you don't want them to run out of work if, uh, because then they will not be occupied all the time. And if you have more than one step in your process, you typically want to have a backlog or uh, a queue of work for the next worker as well, so you don't risk them running out of work. So this is really a strategy of high having uh, your resources optimized and utilized all the time. If we then look at a process that are flow efficiency first, uh, we will see that you will design the work towards the customer and you will try to avoid to have a queue in front of the worker or the machine and you also try to avoid to have a queue between the different steps in the process which means that the workers or the machines can be without work from time to time but the time for the customer will be much much less and that would be on the flow efficiency side. And if you look at the business strategy or operational strategy of how to operate your processes in a flow efficiency first approach, this is actually the business strategy that is called lean. Because then we try to focus on getting the things out to the customer as fast as possible, with as little, little weight as possible, and are not as concerned for the resource efficiency. But of course, over time, we want to kind of strive towards Nirvana and also get uh, our resources uh, busy as much as possible, but not on the expense of the customer. So if we look at these two processes, which one do you think is the most expensive one? First or second? <laughs> First one, second one. So the studies made in Sweden and also in Canada says that they are more or less the same in terms of cost. There's no major differences, probably due to other things than how you operate the processes. But in terms for how the customer will experience this, I think both, all of you think there's a major difference. And if we look at the process for Maria, it could be that those, the difference in hours could actually mean a lot of extra cost in terms of extra healthcare cost and maybe even if she will survive or not. 
So if we look at these pro this process, we have three different kind of bricks. We have the green ones, that would be the value added uh, work, that would be the actual demand that the customer has on the process. Then we have the red ones, that would be non-value added work, that would be waiting time. And then we have the yellow ones that would be non-value added but required to operate the process how we have set it up. So in Maria's case, we saw quite a bit of yellow bricks in the system due to how the system was set up. So let's look at some common red bricks. So the most common kind of red brick would be uh, waiting in queues, waiting for something. Uh, one type of wait would be waiting for decisions and also, of course, waiting for someone else to finish their work. If we look at the yellow bricks, some common ones are rework due to things like defects, handovers, uh, and lack of understanding of requirements. And also things like over-processing that we are doing things uh, like reprioritizing and maintaining a backlog of lots of items and reprioritizing them all the time. Or in, in the example we had with Maria, the extra work on when you're actually calling up to the hospital and asking for additional information. That is uh, things that we don't have to do if we had set up the process in a different way. So I've done kind of studies, a few studies with the cli clients I have and looking at the resource or flow efficiency in terms of how much is red, green and yellow bricks in our customers' processes. And what I typically see is a one to five percent of the time, the actual calendar time the, of part of the lead time would be value added time. I have never <laughs> seen a process higher than 5% when I map it from the actual start of demand until we actually delivered it. I know David has quoted some numbers where he talked about uh, numbers above 20 and towards 40%. And if I understand it correctly, he then thinks about from you have actually committed to do the work until it's delivered. But most of the time in most processes, it's actually the time before we commit to do the work that is the longest part of the work. But even in, t in some uh, cases, I've seen a very, very low flow efficiency inside when we have the committed to do the work as well. So the question, if, if you would look at your processes, how much red and yellow bricks would you have in your processes? Would it be a lot? or not that much? What do you think? Quite a lot. Probably a lot. And what you can do, what we have, what we have actually seen here, could be a way to do what's called a value stream map. That we are following one person, or in, uh, in this case, or one feature through the flow of how we do create the value for the customer and map this out like this. So let me give you another ex example. We have the BCB company and we have the Kara company. Uh, and these are doing uh, testing work in an environment which is uh, quite hard to do. It's uh, in a big complicated system. Uh, and we will see how they have two different approaches of how to do testing. So let's start with the BCB company. He do some preparation work to set up the test environment to do the, te the actual testing. Then he start testing and unfortunately he discovers a bug. Because the supporting team to kind of fix the bugs is not available. He has to write down kind of an error report and some description of the fault, put that into Jira and send it off. And of course he doesn't want to feel like he's not He's not doing anything useful. Uh, so while he is waiting, he's kind of tearing the environment down and starting the test case 
uh, the next test case and building up the test environment again, uh, rebuilding the environment. And while he's doing that, the support team actually comes back and says, well, we need some additional traces so we can kind of find out what this uh, problem is really about. And the tester says, of course, as soon as I'm done with this test setup and run the, this test case I've just started, I will get back to you and give you that information. He runs the test and of course he finds a bug uh, in this test case as well. He enters the information into the Jira system and then moves back to the first test case. He rebuilds the environment and while he's doing that, the other support teams come back and say, we need some more error uh, logs to debug this information. And the tester says, of course, I will get back to you as soon as we're done uh, with the other test. And then he generates the trace logs for the first team. And then he moves back. He sets up the environment. He moves back, sets up the environment again, and try to give the error logs for the second test. He produces that information, and while he's doing that, the first uh, support team is getting back and say, we have a solution that we want to try and see if this has resolved the problem. And uh, the tester says, of course, I will get back to you as soon as we're done with the other testing. And even down here, we find another issue, so we file that. We move back to the first test case. We set build up the environment again, uh, run the test cases, and we are actually done and have completed the first test case. And then the tester moves back, builds up the environment, and tries the latest fix from support team two and he's done with both test cases in a successful manner. Is this something you kind of recognize? I get some nods. So let's see how the, the Kata company would work. We have the same setup time. We have to rebuild the environment. We set it up for the first test case. We start the test and of course he finds a bug. Uh, but instead of filing a bug in Jira, he goes to the support team and says, I found a bug, can you please come and help me when, uh, when you have time? And we will try to resolve this problem. And they say, yes, of course, we're a little bit busy right now, but we will get back to you as soon as we can. So the tester goes back to his environment, but instead of starting new work, they are actually starting to do some process improvement work. They're looking at how they can improve uh, the testing process. So eventually the support team comes back and they say, we need some more traces. And because the environment is still up and running uh, at the state it was before, the tester can rerun the, the failing test immediately and give the support team the traces that they need so they can go off and try to find a fix for it. And while he's waiting for the fix, he gets back in to do some more uh, education, reading some books, but also doing some process improvements. Eventually, the, test, the support team comes back, and because the environment is up and ready, uh, we can just reload the software, and we will retest uh, the fix, and we're done with test case one. And then we move on to test case two. We rebuild the environment, we do the test, and you will see the same pattern repeats again. And then we are done. So what we can see here is that we have doing more or less the same thing. We have the same amount of green bricks in both of them. We are doing the same amount of time setting up the environments when we do the setup. But they are actually finished. The test case number one here is finished much, much earlier than here. And we are actually finishing both test cases quite a bit earlier than in the BCB company. So in terms of being the fastest, it's the Carter company. And the Carter company have, of course, had time to do some process improvement as well. So these are really two different aspects of how to run this. 
Uh, and this is also from a real situation in a big company doing telecommunication uh, work that we have seen a very similar pattern. So both these examples are kind of governed by th the three laws of how processes works. And these three laws are Little's law, the law of bottlenecks, and law of variation. So maybe you've heard of Little's law, this, uh, if you went to uh, a talk before by uh, uh, Demeter, yeah? So if we take this, for example, this is uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, in the morning, I'm standing above what's called Essingeleden. Uh, if we want to go from here up until here, do you think it will go faster when it looks like this or when it looks like this? It's actually a trick question because it could be that in this case everyone is moving very fast and here they are parked. Uh, so, <laughs> but yes, if we look at the board, uh, a Kanban board like this, if it looks like this, and we want to move something into the to-do queue here until it's done, will it go faster in this example or in this example? It's the same idea. It's just two different concepts, but the same thing, and they are governed, both of them, by something called Little's Law. Uh, and I have put it here, it's the same formula, but I've kind of reshuffled the numbers a little bit. So we have the work in process, uh, through throughput, and then lead time. And it should be average uh, work in progress through average throughput and, through, and uh, will give you the average lead time. So putting some simple numbers here, if we have an average of 12 items in the system, and we can process 12 items per minute, the average lead time of that system would be one minute. So how can we, if we want to half the lead time, the average lead time for things in the system, what would be the easiest way to do in this system? Yes, half the number of things that we have in the system. And of course, if we go the other way, we will double the lead time if we double the amount of work in process. So this is kind of basic queuing theory and there's, it will work for more or less any process. There's some exceptions to this, but more or less all the time. And I, I typically say when the Little's law doesn't apply to your system, you have approved quite a bit. And maybe it's a half a lifetime a year or so. But uh, after that, we need to go into a little bit more advanced uh, queuing theory. But if we look at this at projects, we have three projects, A, B, and C. We map them out on a Gantt chart. If we would work on first A and then B and then C, the Gantt chart would look something like this. So in terms of economics, which one would be preferable? The second one, why? So if we make money from the features, we could potentially start to earn money from feature A uh, earlier in this compared to this one. So if we need to borrow money to run our projects, here we can actually start to make some money that potentially could fund, fund feature C. And in this case, we actually have to borrow money all the way through. And another benefit would be maybe when you have put feature A and feature B out into the field, you get feedback if the customer actually wants feature C or you need to do something else. But in this case, we get that feedback much, much later. And of course, this doesn't work in all contexts, but if you think of this as kind of the first way of you think how you structure work, it will probably benefit you. So, then we move over to the law of bottlenecks. And every process has at least one bottleneck, one major bottleneck. So, if this is our system, in this case, traffic, 
We have a capacity of six cars per second here. We have a capacity of four cars per second here and a capacity of six cars per second here. The total throughput through this system over time will be as in the bottleneck. So the total throughput of this system will never go higher over time than uh, we have in the bottleneck. So as long as we have capacity in front of the system that is larger than the capacity at the bottleneck, we will go as fast as the bottleneck. But if we overload the system in front of the bottleneck, so we're actually utilizing uh, the full capacity in front of the bottleneck, what we're actually doing is extending, we are adding more work in progress into the system. So Little's law will say, if we add things into the system, the lead time of the system will go up and we will not go faster than the capacity at the bottleneck. And also, as long as we have equal or higher capacity after the bottleneck, we will go as fast as the bottleneck. And if we have more capacity, uh, quite a bit larger capacity after the bottleneck than at the bottleneck, we will not go faster over time compared to how fast we can go at the bottleneck. Any questions or reflection on that before we move on? Then we get to the law of variation. So if we look at systems and we, where we have resource efficiency, how much we are utilizing our resources. If we talk about roads, this would be the amount of, of uh, uh, cars that we have on the road compared to the, the, to the space. And we have the lead time. If we have low variation, we will have a curve looking something like this. We can get quite high in re resource efficiency before we see the lead time kick up very steeply. But if we have a system with high variability, we will see that even at quite low resource efficiency, the lead times will start to kick up. So if we put this into the graph of resource efficiency and flow efficiency, if we want to move towards uh, nirvana, which is more or less impossible, it's only theoretical that you can uh, arrive here. If you have low variation, you can't really move higher than this move into the red triangle here. But if you have high variation in the system, it, you will come even lower. So depending on your context, you might want to drive out the process variation in your system, not the actual content, but the process variation in the system. So you will get, when you're actually doing work, you're doing highly valuable work, and that, of course, can have very high variation. But how you execute the process might be valuable to be in a more of a low variation uh, context. So what are some of the common sources of variation? So the arrival rate of work, do we have a steady stream of work coming in? Or is it very uneven? I had a customer that had kind of a, a billing cycle of once a month and we saw work arriving uh, very close to the end of the billing cycle which meant that there was kind of a traffic jam or a, a morning traffic so to say. Uh, we also have size and complexity. The work we actually do is different size and complexity would affect when the first step typically ends, which will then affect the arrival rate until the next step. We have also things like ad hoc processes. Are we actually swarming on work? So we're not stabilizing our processes. Everyone working in the part of the system that they are responsible for, but actually always having ad hoc supporting in different parts of the system. That will actually add to the variation of the system. Uh, are we also setting up the system to be load balanced, to optimize for uh, output? We will also add variation into the system, which will be harder than to see how we can actually reach uh, a high flow efficiency and resource efficiency at the same time. 
and of course availability of capacity uh, and competence. So now if we have these three laws, what would be some common ways to look at how we can improve flow efficiency? So one of the most obvious one would be to try to reduce the work in process. So what's the benefit of reducing work in process? We talked about little slow and we will get uh, faster lead time uh, and things like that, but there's also an added benefit of trying to reduce uh, the work in process. So if we look at this river, we have a sluice over here, uh, and we would look at this, uh, this river or this canal, do we see any problems? We just see water floating through here. But what happens if we start to actually lower the water level? When we start to lower the water level in the system, we will start to discover there are some, some rocks in the system here that are actually stopping flow or actually adding turbulence into the system that will hinder us to see and understand how the system really works. So by lowering the water level in the system, it will be easier to understand where you have the problems in the system. So kind of the hidden part of using work in process is when you lower the amount of work in process in the system, you will uncover opportunities to imp improve your process. And this is, for me, one of the most important parts of using uh, working process. But it will also help you to improve the overall system over time. Another way to increase flow efficiency is to reduce batch size. Uh, we could do things like continuous delivery. We could avoid running projects where we have a big ramp up part and we have a closing part of the projects that would actually uh, adding variation into the system. We can also do things like smaller features because if we have a mix of lorries and cars in the road, if we have just one type of them in the system at the same time, it's actually easier to get a higher utilization in the system and therefore we can get a more steady and even flow through the system. So we should try to do things like a most, uh, minimal markable feature or a minimal uh, viable product approach to the work we do. And of course we can also try to improve quality because this reduces the amount of rework that we will have in the system. And if we look back to the healthcare system, if we would have focused on quality, maybe we didn't have to call in and get uh, additional information for when we will get uh, the summon for getting to the hospital and things like that. That is typically rework that is unnecessary and is based on how we set up the system. We can also do things like pair programming and test-driven development to kind of change the order of how we execute the process and therefore evening out and reducing the amount of problems. And we should also stop the line and try to find the root cause uh, of the problems in the, in the process. So we should not swarm on work, but we should stop the line and actually swarm on the problems of the process. Because if we swarm on work, we are adding more variation to the system. But if we swarm on fixing problem, over time we will get an even more stable system that we can see how it works and we can improve it. And that is actually in the last uh, bullet of reducing uh, variation. So one common way to reduce variation would be to reduce batch size. Maybe use a mix of uh, a mixed feature portfolio, meaning that you have different sizes of complexity and size, so you can use them uh, to get an even and steady mix in the system. So you will not get all lorries coming at once, and then you will have just uh, regular cars, or just like we have morning and afternoon 
rush hour, if we can even it out over the day, that is typically something that we want to do. And one way to do that would be to remove projects or iterations because they actually are creating morning and afternoon rush hour. And the last one, or the two second, the, the last ones here, we have try to avoid load balancing your processes because load balancing the processes would actually add variation into the system. But it, it could be that you will get more output. But over time, it could be beneficial to not load balance your systems. And Can you just expand load balancing there? Okay. So what I mean with that would be if you have, uh, let's say that you have three uh, test environments and you have five teams that would work, that would deliver to the test environment. So then it would be, if you load balance the test environments, you will optimize for short-term short output because whenever one is available, you will give them the work and they will work on it. But if you actually set up the system so they will work with the dedicated test environment, it will be much easier and faster to discover when you have synchronization problems and when you have an imbalance between the different parts of the system. So actually not load balancing would help you to improve the system over time because you makes it easier to understand how it works. But if you load balance between the different uh, test environments, you will add more variation into the system. So here we come down to, are we optimizing for a short-term gain in terms of throughput? Or are we optimizing over the long term towards having a more an even and steady flow of value through the system over time? Did that answer your question? I, I blogged about this, uh, and it's also part of chapter five in Mike Rodder's book, uh, Toyota Kara, which I actually highly recommend. And he explains kind of some of the basic context, uh, concepts from lean manufacturing and kind of the hidden uh, meaning of how they actually used, uh, which I find very, very useful. So time to choose. Do you want your business to operate in the resource efficiency first quadrant? Or do you want to operate in the flow efficiency first quadrant. And with that, I open up for questions. Could you describe what you meant by swarming? Okay. So the typical kind of agile swarming idea is whenever there's a process, there's a, when there's a work to be done that is late or something like that, you typically want the organization to swarm around and try to fix that problem in terms of getting that feature out. Is that kind of, that's the kind of, kind of swarming we, we kind of know about in the agile context, right? Yes. The problem with this agile swarming is that we are adding more variation into the process, how it actually works. So if we think it's a good idea, that people should get together and work on one thing at a time in one part of the process, what we should do is not to do this ad hoc swarming. We should just put that part of the system should have a fixed low whip limit that would force people to work together at that point in the system. So you can build these things, but you have to build that into the system. Yes, you will build it into the system that people will get together at that point and if you do this in a kind of a repeatable manner over and over again, you can understand how the system actually works. Because when you understand how the system works, you can improve it. But if you are just ad hoc swarming over, all over the place, that we, if you have played the Get Kanban game, you typically do that, it will be harder and harder to actually understand how the process works. And you could actually throw the system into uh, resonance, which actually means that it will go out of control. Uh, you remember the bridge uh, outside of Seattle with the wind coming in at the same 
and when it gets into resonance, it actually breaks down. So by doing ad hoc swarming, you can actually get your system into that state. WIP limits is a good way to actually reduce that variation. Yes, please. So if you will do swarming, you should address process problems. Yeah. Uh, and potentially when we build software, it could be to address built-in technical problems that we have in the process. But it shouldn't be the normal way of do, uh, working because then you should try to set up the system so it will be the normal way of working in terms of setting WIP limits. And that's what I mean with not swarming, ad hoc swarming towards work. And in Steven Spears' uh, literature, he talks about uh, high-velocity companies. And what he has observed with uh, companies that has a very high velocity is that they are not swarming on work, but they are really swarming on fixing process problems. Kind of, every, you get everybody together, stop the line, and you try to find the root cause of the problem, eliminate the root cause of the problem, and then you start up uh, uh, the process again and move on. And try to get it into a normal state again. Yes? So I have a question about the part of the service. Yes. Um, because that really does introduce a group variation. Yes. But it, it may also be, in your healthcare example, a way of, you know, sort of background tasks and the treatment tasks or something like that. I guess it may be that it's more displayed as well. It isolates the whole process chain. Um, do you want to comment on the part of the service? Yeah. So Class of service where you have different types of work would have different kind of priorities. Uh, is a way to even out the kind of the high priority work in the system could be stabilized by having low priority work that you will work in the meantime. Uh, so it's a way to reduce um, variability in the kind of the main flow work. And it will also be so you will be occupied as a, a person in the system, you will be occupied doing some work because typically we get quite frustrated if we don't have anything to do. And one of the things that we then tend to do is to pull in new work and start working on that. But if we can do as we did in, uh, in the testers example, if we look at uh, this image for instance, instead of kind of working on other work, they were busy doing low, low priority works in terms of doing process improvements. And whenever high priority works arrive, you step back to the high priority work. That's a way of reducing variability in the main type of work. But you're actually adding more variability into the other type of work. So it depends on. So you need to find a way to find a kind of a common course, a shared uh, sense of purpose. So if we take uh, an American airline, a uh, low fare airline, uh, probably the most famous low fare airline in the world, Southwest Airlines, uh, they have a shared sense of purpose of what they're trying to do. And therefore the pilots will actually step out in the cabin and clean the cabin if needed to. So they are not reducing the, the captain's self-esteem in terms of he being the well-paid captain of the airplane, I'm the only one that can do that. But they have a shared purpose that they want to transport as many people as possible to the low uh, fare as possible. That means that I, as a captain, will actually step out and clean in the cabin as well. So if you can create that shared sense of purpose in the organization, you can kind of potentially get past those uh, those problems. 
and maybe you can add another kind of class of service in terms of process improvement or uh, other things that they can do when not busy with the high priority work. Other questions, reflections, yes? So uh, the company I currently work for, there's a, they are actually trying to move into more of a continuous delivery setup, uh, working on a, on a main track uh, in terms of source, co source control, uh, trying to reduce uh, the batch sizes or the morning and afternoon rush hour in terms of uh, getting the system ready. So the kind of the... Uh, the already known wisdom of doing agile testing actually applies to many of these organizations as well. But you need to kind of explore and experiment what are the limits for your specific context. Uh, and it takes time and it takes uh, a buy-in from the organization to actually dare to try it. But uh, we've seen small steps towards that that's actually moving uh, quite well. And what, what I typically see is also that it will tend to change your architecture of the product. So it will be kind of segmented different, so you can actually deploy with less dependencies, uh, which makes it easier to kind of test it in isolation and move. You will see the smaller datas, deltas of change will be easier to debug and fix. But it is a hard problem to solve, and uh, kind of what I tried to illustrate with the with this one is that typically in that environment, these kind of test environments are truly mega, mega expensive. But if you think of driving, trying to get them busy all the time, you are get, still getting in the trap of resource efficiency first. Uh, the example that I had with, with this process is actually that it's, uh, uh, you can still not optimizing for flow efficiency, uh, for resource efficiency, but get very high flow efficiency in the system with the same cost. So I guess a little bit over time here. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh,